Smells good in here. Wow, it's delicious. What are you making? Chili. Chili. Ooh, I love chili. Excellent. You're a good chili maker then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cool. You got two batches going. Oh, yeah, I got two different kinds. Two different kinds, huh? Well, let's see here. Hmm, that looks good. Yeah, got meat. Um, they look the same to me. Oh, well, this one is just regular boring chili. This one has my special secret ingredient. Oh, ingredient. Uh, what's the difference then? Uh, would you like to try them? Um, I'm kind of scared when you ask me that way. Um, it smells delicious. Oh, well, here, just try it. Okay, I'll try one. I would never try and trick you. Ooh, that is good. That's delicious. I love it. That's great. Yeah. What, what's in the other one, though? My secret ingredient. I can't tell you. <sighs> All right, well, the first one's so good, this one's got to be even better, so. <laughs> Hot! What? It's spicy. What did you put in there? Pepper sauce. Oh my goodness! Give me something to put to cut the heat. Some milk, bread, butter, butter, bread and butter, quick. Oh my goodness! This is margarine. I, I can't. I need butter. Oh, what's the difference? Butter is a dairy product. It'll cut the heat better. Oh, come on. What's the difference? Sometimes. Sometimes there's a big difference, right? That's right. I've been thinking about that question a lot lately, the past few years even, actually. What's the difference? Not in terms of chili. Now, we did ask that question on Super Bowl night, and we look at the different chilies that the judges get to taste. And uh, sometimes you can see a difference, and sometimes you can just taste a difference on those. But I've been asking that question spiritually of my own life. As I've tried to talk more and more about Jesus to people, I've been asking that question of why, what's different about my life that they would want what I have. I think that's a fair question. So what's the difference in my life now that I follow Jesus? And the more I think about that, the more important it has become to me to really define those differences. And to be clear on that in my own heart and my own mind because, because I know that the difference that Jesus has made in my life is worth having. But sometimes I don't take the time to actually think through what those differences are. I know my life is better, but what is better about it? And what I'm discovering is that there are some incredible differences that are in my life, that have been in my life, but I don't take the time to realize them a lot of times and to live them out. I, I was thinking the other day about some things that were in my life before I was a believer, a Christ follower. And as I was, I became a Christian when I was about 17 years old. And if I take those differences in the path that I was on then, and I just extrapolate it out over the last 23 years, 24, I had a birthday this last week, 24 years, the differences could be absolutely enormous. Had I stayed on this path, the, the differences and the, and, the, and the little moral failures and faults and focuses, they might not be that bad then, but if you stay on that path over the course of a couple uh, decades, the difference to where I am now, it, it could be monumental, probably is monumental. What, what difference has Jesus made in your life? As you follow him, and I know maybe some of you came to faith in Jesus very early on, and you think, well, it wasn't a big deal, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't all that bad, I was a kid, what could have I done? Think about the path that you were on. Think about the trajectory your life had, and, and take it out. It's much like archery for me. You know, when I'm shooting my bow and arrow, and, and I'm sighting it in at five yards, if, if my bow is off a half an inch at five yards, and I take that out to 20 yards, I'm going to miss the target by four or five inches. Because the longer you go at that same trajectory, the greater the distance becomes. So I want to ask that question today, what's the difference? Because it's kind of like Mark and Crystal, as you look at a pot of chili and, and they're side by side, you might not be able to see the difference, but there is sometimes a very great difference that's not necessarily on the surface of things. And sometimes the differences that are in our lives as Jesus followers are not necessarily on the surface, but they're absolutely enormous. Let's pause real quick and just ask God to take control of this moment and speak to us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to pause right now. 
And God, I can't preach your word. I can't declare your truth without your power and your authority. And I know that full well. And I don't even want to try this morning. So I lay everything aside, all of my own ambitions, all of my own uh, intentions, all of my pride. I just lay it aside, God. And I just ask you to invade this place. Come right now with your Holy Spirit and, and awaken us and quicken us and help our hearts to become alive with your Spirit so we could drink in the truth that you have for us. God, I pray you would speak with authority, God, that would be undeniable, authority that would be absolutely eternal in its perspective and its scope and its impact on our lives. God, you now speak, Father, not so that we'd be entertained, but God, so that you could be glorified. Jesus, we want to lift you up. We're not here to be entertained today ourselves. We're not here to look good. We're not here to have a, a spiritual country club or a social hour. We're here to meet with a living God. And God, we're desperate for you today. Whether we realize it or not, we are desperate for you. And we need you to speak truth into our lives. God, we're calling out to you as a body, as a family. And we need you to speak truth into our lives. God, we don't just want it, but we are desperate for it. So right now, we surrender everything to you. You just speak, and we'll listen. And we'll do our very, very best to obey under your leadership. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's the difference? Last week we started this series aimed at answering those questions clearly and practically. We started by pointing out that a follower of Jesus Christ lives every day of their life, every day with irrevocable forgiveness of their sin. A follower of Jesus Christ lives every single day with complete, it's total, complete, and irrevocable, can never be changed or taken away with that kind of forgiveness of their own sin in their life. That is absolutely amazing. We can talk about it in Christian circles like it's no big deal. We say, yeah, my sin is forgiven. But that is absolutely astounding. Guilt and shame is no longer a factor for the Christ follower. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, what we're going to look at this week is the result of being forgiven. When you are forgiven by God like that, with complete and irrevocable forgiveness, something transpires. So what does being forgiven lead to? Well, just hang on. Just, we're going to take a fresh look at this, and I think it's going to blow your mind. You've heard it before. Most of you that go to church have heard this before. But if you'll hear this from, from a new perspective, if you'll put on new lenses this morning, I think that your heart will be blown away today. And I can't wait to share it with you. Let me introduce it to you through the, through the Bible. It's uh, in Colossians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the, to the book of Colossians chapter 1. If you don't, we'll have it on the screen for you. Okay? Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 21 through 22. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. Would you stand today just in the honor of reading God's word together? Here's what Paul wrote them. The first chapter of Colossians, verse 21 says, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he, that's God, has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Father, I'm just going to ask you to take your word and, and empower it to change us. Speak now, God, clearly and in a way that we would never, ever be the same. I'm going to ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Let's go through this. From two perspectives, basically in these two verses, there's, there are just two perspectives. There's before Jesus, and then there's after Jesus. Not that you're after Jesus, but it's in Jesus, or after you put your faith in, become a follower of Jesus. So we're going to look at before Jesus, the, the life of the person before Jesus, and then we're going to look at the life of the person after Jesus. I think this is absolutely amazing. So, so check this out. Paul said that all people before Jesus, before Jesus, Paul said people are alienated from God apart from Jesus. They're alienated from God. Apollatro, Apollatrio, and we're going to say all these with me today because I, I hate saying them by myself, and my Greek professors hated it when I tried to say them by myself too. So you go ahead and you say this with me. It's Apollatrio. Say that louder, Tom. 
No. <laughs> Apollo atrio. Here's what it means. I'm just messing with you. Here's what it means. It means completely estranged from something. Totally separated from something. Totally cut off. So it's what it means. Completely estranged or alienated. Totally cut off or separated. That is, before Jesus, we didn't have a little bit of a relationship with God. We didn't have kind of an inkling towards him. We didn't have a little bit of a connection. The Bible says before Jesus, every person, every man, woman, and child is absolutely cut off from Jesus, from God. They don't have a relationship. The Bible even describes us as dead in our sins. We don't think about that very often like that. We don't even realize it in that condition. But that's our condition. Totally cut off. Absolutely estranged. So Paul said that people are alienated apart from Jesus. They're alienated from God. By the way, if you extrapolate that out, that's the exact result. If we stay apart from Jesus, that's our eternal destiny, is that we will be cut off from God. Second thing he says is, People are hostile toward God apart from Jesus. This is kind of a description of why we're alienated, okay? So the first thing he says, we're totally cut off, totally separated. We have no access. There's nothing going on. We can see the very nature of God. We can understand some things about him through creation. We can sense him. We can perceive him. But we don't have a relationship. There's no two-way street going on. We, we can't help but acknowledge that there is a God, Romans says, but we don't have a connection with him. Okay, there's a big difference. So why don't we have that connection? Well, Paul says this because people are hostile toward God apart from Jesus. People are hostile toward God apart from Jesus. It's the Greek word ekthros. It means that we have enmity or hatred. It, it actually has an, a, a, the concept of a, or the way we think. And, and it literally means it's hostile in our thinking or our disposition toward God. That's what that means. That people are hostile in their disposition or their thinking toward God. Now, I know that, let me just use me for an example. When I think back to when I was 14, 15 years old, I had some bumps in the road, and I understand I probably got mad at God at times, but I never thought of myself as hostile toward God. I didn't wake up in the morning and say, God, I just don't like you. I never did that. I never felt hatred toward God. But what it was is that my thinking, the what I thought about, the very nature of my mind was hostile toward God. That is, it was opposite of the things that, that, that God loved and chose as, uh, were holy and dear to him. So when I thought about the things that I thought about, when I thought about the selfish things, or when I thought about the hateful toward, hatefulness towards somebody else, or, or rebellion towards parents, or, or lying, or all the things that maybe I did when I was a kid, those things create, those are hostility, that's hostility toward God because it's opposite of God. You don't have to wake up in the morning and shake your fist at him to hate him. It's that our thinking is so twisted and bent by sin and our sinful nature that it creates that hostility toward God. We don't even realize it. We, we really don't even realize it. I remember part of this was a good thing, and part of it really was just my hostility toward God. And I've told you this before, but my whole family was Lutheran. And in, in the Lutheran denomination, you go through something called confirmation. You do that in other denominations, too. And when I went to my first confirmation class, I determined I would never, ever, ever go back. First and foremost, I mean, I didn't like the environment. I didn't like the other kids that were in there. I didn't like, I didn't like anything about it. But most of all, if I'm honest, I, could have cared, I just didn't care less about getting to know anything about God. I mean, I, I really think it was designed that, I mean, some great things came out of that, honestly. But, but part of my heart was, is God, I don't care. I would rather go do the things that I like doing than sit in this room and learn things about the Bible or you. So part, that's hostility towards God that is a lack of, I didn't care anything about him. When I sat in church, I drew pictures on the back of my bulletin. I can blame it on the church. I can blame it on how sterile it was and how stiff and formal it was. I, a thousand things. But the bottom line is, in my heart, 
If I had a desire to know God, I could have begun to know him there because they did have a Bible. They did have a preacher talking about God. He could have answered questions, but not me. I didn't want anything to do with him. There was hostility in my mind. I wanted to go do what I wanted to go do. That's the very heart of hostility towards him. Ekthros, enmity, hatred, hostility in our disposition, our attitude towards him. Then the next thing, Paul said people are engaged in evil deeds apart from Jesus. This is where we get all mixed up because we think of evil deeds and we start thinking of those, those crazy things that you see on CSI or, 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 or Law and Order S, SVU or, or whatever and you think of the really heinous crimes of humanity. And those are evil deeds, no doubt. But you know, I had evil deeds in my life too because the Bible doesn't say that you have to be a child molester or you have to be an arson to be involved in evil or wicked deeds. The Bible says right here, it says we were all, in fact, all engaged in evil deeds apart from Jesus. Paneros, it's wicked or corrupt works is what it means. Wicked or corrupt When I act selfishly, that's wicked and corrupt. When I tell a half-truth, in God's perspective, it's wicked and it's corrupt. If I, have a, if I have a thought that veers away from faithfulness to my wife, did you know that's wicked and corrupt? Just a thought. If I'm greedy for a moment and I say, I want more than I want to give, it's wicked and it's corrupt. But we don't want to do that. We want to say, well, those people on TV, that kind of stuff, that's all corrupt. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not molesting anybody. I'm not killing anybody. I'm not stealing anything. They're wicked and corrupt. I'm just not perfect. We're okay with that, right? I'm not perfect. We all admit that. You know what God calls not being perfect? Wicked and corrupt. That's what he calls it. And it is. It's not an overstatement by him. It's an understatement by us that gets it all messed up. But listen to this. In spite of who we were, in spite of who we are, and what we're doing, God chooses to take action to restore us to himself. That, that is the turning point that is absolutely amazing this morning that I'm so excited to tell you about. Because when I was wicked and corrupt, when I was hostile in my mind, when I was separated from God at the age of 17, God said, I want to have a relationship with you, Casey. I want to be your friend. I didn't want to be his friend. In fact, the week that I was at Falls Creek, Oklahoma, listening to Dr. Joel Gregory from First Baptist Church of Dallas preach way 10 miles over my head, the reason I was there had nothing to do with me seeking God. It had everything to do with trying to win the tournament in softball and girls that were running around at that, at that place. That's why I was there. Bottom line, my best friend, Andy Hankins, Baptist preacher's son, he tried from fifth grade until my freshman year in high school to get me to come to church and to get me to go to Falls Creek with him. The year he left, I went. And he came back and he said, what is up with that? Why did, you know, why? I, I was like, you didn't tell me there was all these girls and this sports was all here. You didn't tell me that part. You're telling me stuff about God. I didn't have anything to do with that. Because I was wicked and I was corrupt. And I was without him. And I had a hateful disposition. But God, God wanted a relationship with me so bad that he met me there at False Creek, Oklahoma. And he was unwilling to let me stay in my sin and he took action to restore me to himself so we're going to look at that this is amazing I want you to see what, what God's done after Jesus what it's like what's the difference what happens here's what Paul says Paul reminds them all that Jesus that in Jesus God has totally transformed our condition before God in Jesus God has totally totally transformed your condition or your position before God now when I say that first thing that comes in my mind Maybe it's, maybe it's our enemy this morning. The first thing that comes to my mind is, I wonder if they even care. I wonder how many of us care here today that our position, our condition before God, I'm not talking theologically, I'm talking literally that our position before God has radically changed in Jesus. 
I just wonder how many of us really get this. Look at, look at what it says. Paul said that through Jesus we are reconciled to God. Now you are saying this Greek word with me because it's like five syllables. And I, I'm determined to honor my Greek professor because he was wonderful. He was a graduate student and he was so kind. It was a blessing of going to the satellite campus of First Baptist Church in Garland as I got a grad student. And see, the great thing about a grad student is they, they remember. They aren't so far away from it that they think that everybody lives and breathes Greek. Steve was his name, and that's what we called him. We didn't call him doctor or anything. He wasn't a doctor yet. But he was awesome. And, and I want to honor Steve today because he was cool about Greek. And I made it through four semesters of Greek. I don't know what my grade was, but I'm pretty sure it's the one that kept me from having the high enough GPA to go back to PhD to get my PhD, which was kind of strategic on my part, because now I'm not tempted at all to work on that. I can't. I just can't. My GPA is too low. All right. I didn't tell you all that on my resume, by the way. <laughs> Took me five years to confess to that. <laughs> Apa kata lasso. Apa kata lasso. That's a cool word, and it means to reconcile. Kelly and I were working on our checkbook yesterday, and the first thing we do is reconcile it, right? So we get online, and we look at all the checks or the debits that we've written, make sure that we have those same ones written in the checkbook. I'm not so good at that. I, don't, I love debit cards, but they are a curse to me. So, you know, I try to keep my receipts. You know, this happens at church. But I don't always. And then Kelly's like, what's this $5.61 to this BP? I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> but put it in the checkbook because the bank says we spent it. When we get all those things written down, when the bank says we have this and we have that match, we are reconciled. We're brought back together. And the Bible says this amazing thing. He says that through Jesus, Paul says through Jesus, we are reconciled to God. Apokatalaso means a restoration of a relationship of peace that has been disturbed. To restore completely is what it means. Now, originally, see, it's talking about originally when God created you and when God created mankind, he didn't create us for hostility. He didn't create us so that we could be at odds with him, so that we'd have en enmity and strife and hatred and discord. He created us for a relationship of peace. Adam and Eve walked in the Garden of Eden in peace with God before the fall. God, that's why God created for us. And so when it says that, that through Jesus, God has reconciled us, he has restored a relationship of peace that has been disturbed. Amazing stuff, because this is an already but not yet truth. Okay, so hang with me. Already, right now, this very moment, for everybody who has placed their faith in Jesus in this room, if you are a Jesus follower, this is already truth. You are right with God. Period. He said, well, Casey, I, I, I'm glad you think that, but you don't know what I did this morning. You don't know what I did last night. You don't know I've had a fight with my wife. I've rebelled against my parents. I cheated on a test. You don't know. My question would not be, how well are you performing right now? My question is, do you place your faith in Jesus today? And the Bible says if you've done that, if you're a Jesus follower, you are reconciled. Apa kata lasso. You are brought back into a relationship of peace. Regardless of your sin nature, it is obliterated in terms of its impact on your standing with God. You are reconciled now. Everybody in here who is a Jesus follower is now reconciled. It doesn't mean that God winks at sin or that he doesn't care about it, but it doesn't Take away your standing of reconciled with the Father today. You've been reconciled to him. So here's how Paul describes that restored relationship with God. Paul said that we're holy because of Jesus. No one walks around calling themselves holy today unless they're saying, well, people think I'm a holy roller or I'm holier than thou. Usually when you use the word holy, it's in a negative term, right? It's kind of a slam, Agios is the Greek word, and it means to be pure, upright, and blameless. You've got to stay with me here. This is awesome stuff. You are in Jesus, holy before God. You are pure. 
You are upright and you are blameless. And you are still arguing with me in your mind right now saying, you don't know, Pastor, you just don't know. I'm glad you think that about me, but you don't know. Now, I'm not talking about what I don't see or the sin that you struggle with. I'm talking about your standing before the Father today. You don't vacillate in this standing. It doesn't change based on your performance. Your standing before God is permanent and irrevocable. And the Bible says you are holy, pure, blameless, and upright. That is amazing. That's who you are in Jesus. That's a difference that you are and that you have in Jesus. And Paul said we are holy because of Jesus. And Paul said we are blameless because of Jesus. These next two words are very similar, but there's some... Distinction. Amamos is the word for blameless. It means literally nothing is amiss. You're without blame or fault. Nothing's amiss without blame or fault. It's a term that's used to describe a sacrifice in the Old Testament that was spotless or without blemish or something that would, would render it unworthy to be offered. So if they brought a, a lamb for, for an offering... If it was amamos, it was perfect. It didn't have a spot. It wasn't defiled in any way. It didn't have a blemish on it. It was the best that they had. It was pure. It was upright. Or it was, it was, it was, uh, it was perfect and without fault or blame. That's who you are in Jesus. It's amazing, I know, and it's hard to swallow at times. But you're without blame. You couldn't be reconciled to God. If this were not true, then your standing before God is changing perpetually based on your performance. You get that? If this isn't true, then every time you sin, you fall out of fellowship. You're not holy. You're not upright. You're not pure. If this isn't true, then something's amiss and something's right. And, and something, you're with blame and you're with fault and you're without fault. And you're just on this perpetual road of performance and failure and success and failure and success. And most of the time we'd be in failure. But you've got to understand this is your permanent condition and position before God. This is how he sees you because Jesus lives in you. This is God's perspective on who you are. And you know, we always want to argue, well, what about my sin? What about the things that I do? First of all, we're not dealing with that this morning, but let me hit, let me hit it real quick. Your sin today can never affect your standing before God. It can't touch the things we're talking about. It can't touch the fact that God sees you as holy, and it can't touch the, the, the fact that God sees you as blameless. It can affect the intimacy of your relationship today. It, it can do that. But it cannot change your position before God. And we're talking about your position. We're talking about your standing in the family. When, the best way I can describe this again is with my own children. When they are born into my family, they are my sons. Not daughters, because I am four sons. And they're always going to be my sons. Always. And I'm going to love them ferociously for the rest of their lives or my life. And they're going to fail and they're going to disobey and they're going to do things wrong. And when they do that, it's going to hurt my heart. And it's going to cause some friction in the relationship. But it will never, ever, it couldn't change the fact that they are my dearly loved children. And that's what I'm trying to communicate to you about the Father today. That in Jesus, you are his dearly loved child. And that means you are holy, you're pure, upright, and blameless. It means that you're, you are blameless with nothing amiss, no fault or blame before you. And then Paul said this. He said, you are beyond reproach. I love this one. It's the hardest one to say. Anangletos. I have to say it in two words. Anangletos. And it means this. It means to be totally free from legal charge unaccusable is the real term. That is amazing. Did you know that you are unaccusable in the Father's sight today? Satan, your enemy, wants to accuse you constantly, and he does. And he brings you before the Father, and he says, Father, you don't know what they've done. You, did you see what they've done? They're, they're terrible. How can you love them? And the Father says, they're unaccusable. You can't bring a charge against them. 
But why? They, they've sinned. They've, they've lusted. They've cheated. They've, they've hurt people. They've hated. But because, because of Jesus, just because of Jesus, they're unaccusable. Get away, accuser. You are unaccusable today. Satan will try to accuse you, and when he can't convince the Father because he can't, he will try to convince you because you can be convinced that you're accusable. And many of you are walking around spiritually slump-shouldered because you've taken on the accusation. Do you feel like a second-rate Christian? And that is crazy, and nothing more than a result of you buying a lie from the accuser because the Bible says you are unaccusable. So are you in Jesus? Well, yes, pastor, I'm in Jesus. I'm a Jesus follower. I love Jesus. Then you are unaccusable. But what about, no, 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 no. You can deal with that, confess it, walk away from it, but you are unaccusable. You're still his daughter. You are still his son. You are dearly loved. You are holy, blameless, pure, and upright before the Father. And you always will be. You are unaccusable. That is amazing. In Jesus, you are permanently restored to a right relationship with God. Get that this morning and let it sink in. In Jesus, you are permanently restored to a right relationship with God. Can you mess things up? You can't mess your standing up. You're his son. And you're his daughter. And God loves his children flawlessly. My question is, I wonder if, how many of us get this. I don't know that we realize we stand completely reconciled before God who loves us fiercely. I don't know that we get that. I don't know that, honestly, I get that sometimes. Because I think I just kind of go through life sometimes and, you know, I do what I do and I, I don't stop to think about my position before God. Well, Pastor, are you asking me to stop and think about my position before God? Yeah, I think I am. Because I think this is incredible. Because I'm his son. Always. And how does he feel about me? He says I'm holy. He says I'm pure and blameless and unaccusable. Why am I carrying on, taking on these burdens and these failures and these faults and these fears and this shame? I don't have to. And you, you don't either. I don't know that we really get the nature of being reconciled to God like this because God enjoys you. You may have a hard time with that, but the fact is God enjoys you. You are his friend. He knows you and he likes you. Not because you're a great person, but because of Jesus living in you. See, your sin is forgiven and, and you now have an unbreakable relationship with God as your heavenly father. It's unbreakable. I want you to hear that today and I want you to embed it in your heart that it's unbreakable. It can't be even fractured for a moment. It can't be touched. It's unbreakable because you're unaccusable, because you're, you're, you're without fault or blame, because you're pure and upright and blameless. Not in your performance for God, but in your position before Him. Let me read some scriptures to you and then we're going to close this out. Paul said this in Romans 8. 38 through 39, it's on the screen. He says, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me ask you a question you answer out loud. What can separate you from God's love? Nothing. Right. I mean, he's pretty clear right there, right? So how do you approach God? Do you approach him as your, as your father? You're his child? Are you secure in that standing? I mean secure, rock solid, immovable, secure that I am your child and you are my daddy and I can climb in your lap day or night, false or no false, perfect or imperfect, I can come to you. 
Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12 says, Because of Christ and our faith in Him. Let me read that aloud. Because of Christ and our faith in Him. Say it with me. Because of Christ and our faith in Him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. How do you have to come to God? Crawling in and say, Oh, man, golly, I hope He takes me this time. Father, i got to tell you, I messed up again. Father, I've got to tell you that I'm not, I'm not perfect. And he's saying, I know, you're my son, you're my child, and that is why I sent Jesus. Because in Jesus, it says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly, day or night, good or bad, failures or no failures, we can come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Hebrews says the same thing. He says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. I love that. Let's come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Why? Because there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Because you've been reconciled to God by faith in Jesus, you don't ever have to question where you stand with God. Take that away today. Walk away with that truth today. Because of faith in Jesus, you don't ever have to question where you stand with God. Ever. I'm not saying ignore your sin tendencies. I'm not saying don't tend to the intimacy of your relationship with the Father. But you don't ever question where you stand with Him again. You will always be His child. It's irrevocable. And you're always welcome. Why? Because you've been reconciled to God. I want you to watch this song by 10th Avenue North and let, let some of these truths sink in and we'll We'll finish up with this. Notice he said here, in my side. Please don't fight these hands that are holding you. Because you're reconciled. It's incredible. You get that? I think you're going to talk a lot more about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. and Thank you for this truth. Lord, I'm blown away. I am blown away by this. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for changing the trajectory of my life. And thank you that who I am is irrevocable before you. That I am your son. And you love me dearly. It is hard for me to even say that out loud, Lord, because I feel at times so unlovable. And God, if I as a pastor of this church feel that way, I know all the more the people sitting in front of me struggle even more at times with that truth. But you seal that in our hearts through the indwelling Holy Spirit today that we are your children. We are reconciled. And nothing in all of creation could ever change that. Lord, we lift that prayer to you in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.